Good morning. Thank you guys so much for worshiping with us this morning as we get to celebrate communion together as a family. Before we get started, I just want to say thank you. Revo Church has been able to meet needs all across our city, and that's because of generosity of people like you. We've been able to give masks to people that don't have any. We've been able to fill shelves in food banks across our city. We've even been able to provide counseling services for people that are facing the mental and emotional toll that's so prevalent in our society right now. Even our ability to have services and content online every week is made possible by your generosity. So thank you. Thank you for the people in our city that have a meal to eat today. Thank you for the people in our city that have pre-existing conditions or the elderly that now have masks to wear. Thank you for the people that are accessing our online content and are encouraged by the hope of Jesus. As a staff team, it is our honor and privilege. We are humbled to partner with you guys as we spark a revolution of life change through Jesus. And we don't just want to meet the physical needs. We also want to stay connected to our family spiritually. One of the ways that we do that is by prayer. And so would you do me a favor? We would love to pray for you. Would you guys send us an email at prayer at discoverrevo.com? We have a team right now that is ready to receive your prayer requests. It doesn't matter how big or how small the request is. We would love to go to our big God and ask big things for our people. And as I mentioned before, we're celebrating communion today. And I want to give you a chance right now to get your supplies together. You may not be prepared with all the supplies that you have, the tr traditional ones like grape juice or crackers, and that's okay. Even if you have to do this with water and sandwich bread, that's perfect. See, the power is not in the items, but in what they represent. The power is in looking and remembering what Jesus has done for you and he's done for me. So let's worship now. Let's sing together. Let's open up God's words together. And let's celebrate communion and the great things that Jesus has done for us.
morning, church. Thank you so much for tuning in for our communion worship experience. Communion is a beautiful time of reflection and remembrance for us as we remember the completed work of Jesus as he went and died for all of our sins on the cross. The death thought that it had won on Good Friday, Resurrection Sunday was coming. And Jesus went knowing that he was bearing the sins of the world, conquering death and then giving us life eternal. In Luke 24, it tells the story of the resurrection. And as the women approach the tomb, they're asked one of the most amazing questions. In verses five and six, it says, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, he has risen. And in that moment, the resurrection was announced to the whole world. Today, we have the opportunity to seek Jesus as well, not among the dead, but among the living. And he lives at the right hand of our Lord and in our hearts today. What a beautiful opportunity to approach his throne with confidence, to bow at his feet, to remember his sacrifice and to give King Jesus the praise that he's due. I invite you today to prepare your hearts as we sing praises to the King. There was a moment when the lights went out When death had claimed its victory The King of love had given up his life darkest day in history there on a cross they made for sinners for every curse his blood atoned one final breath and it was finished but not the end we could have known for the earth began to shake And the veil was torn What sacrifice was made As the heavens roared All hail King Jesus
is my Savior's blood. The beauty of heaven wrapped in my shame. The image of love upon death's frame. If having my heart was worth Thank you. 
Grab your Bible. Let's go 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. That's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And here's what you need to know today. Christians are an unshakable people. Soak that in for just a second. Christian, brother or sister, you are unshakable. You are immovable. When everything is swirling around you, you are firmly fixed and held securely by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I think that can be a helpful thing to be reminded of in a season of life when many things are, in fact, being shaken. For some, health has been shaken. For some, their finances have been shaken. For some, their trust in this institution or that institution has been shaken. Many things from many different angles are being shaken up at the moment. And so, it can be a helpful thing to remember that as Christians who belong to the Lord Jesus, we are always held securely by Him. Now, part of the unshakable nature of a Christian is owing to the fact that we know the future. You thought about that before? You know what the end of your life is going to bring. You know what the end of this epoch of time is going to bring. You literally know the future. Now, given that fact, it's been odd to me that in light of current events, the liberal use of the word unprecedented, has just been a head-scratcher for me. You guys have probably heard that word. It began to be used in lots of mainstream media reporting, and so it's just sort of trickled down to the way that everybody is talking about the current circumstance and our infatuation with this new coronavirus. And it's just been curious to me, the use of this word, unprecedented, Because I have yet to see what is unprecedented about the moment of time in which we're living. What exactly is unprecedented about outbreaks of history, or or excuse me, uh, about outbreaks of sickness if you're a student of history? What's unprecedented about that? What's unprecedented about panic? What is unprecedented about vehement disagreement with regard to how the government handles social problems? It it seems to me that nothing in the current moment is actually unprecedented at all, but that at various points in human history, even American history, that we have found ourselves here before. But let me say this, even if something in the present moment was in fact unprecedented, for Christians, it, not ought, it ought not to ever have been unforeseen or unexpected, even if we lacked precedent for it. What did the Lord Jesus tell us? In this life, you will have what? Trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. You see, the Lord Jesus is reminding us that we know the future, <laughs> He says, not only do you know the future in terms of the end, you actually even know the temporal future. Not all the details, of course, but what did the Lord Jesus say? Here's your immediate future, trouble. (laughs) Now, that may not be emotionally helpful, but in terms of preparation, it is a helpful thing to know to expect trouble in this life. In this life, you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. That is to say, The immediate future will bring with it trouble, and the end of the age will bring with it absolute victory over that trouble, because Christ has overcome all of the ills of the world, and we are in Him, so that victory is our victory, and it will be handed to us upon the return of Christ. You know the future. And today, as we prepare to celebrate the communion meal together, it is a call to remember the future. 
I know we have a tendency to think of remembrance as, as being something in the past. We remember things that have happened. But ultimately, if we're going to remember the death of the Lord Jesus today through the symbols, the emblems of the, the bread and the cup, then to rightly remember the death of the Lord Jesus is to remember what that death accomplishes for us, and that is a secure future. And so that's what we'll consider today. What is the future that the Lord Jesus has purchased for us through His death on the cross? So we'll begin in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Here's what it says. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Now, the Apostle Paul is writing here to effectively baby Christians. These Thessalonians have been Christians for a matter of months. And Paul was not able to stay with them to teach them and bring them up in the Lord Jesus for as long as he wanted to before he ended up having to leave them. And so this is a theologically deficient people. They are baby Christians who are without their teacher. They're without their pastor. And so he's writing because he doesn't want them to be uninformed. He doesn't want them to be ignorant. He's saying, I know that I wasn't able to instruct you and teach you and coach you as much as is necessary. I wasn't able to impart to you all of the theological and biblical truths that you're going to need. But you can't be uninformed, so in the absence of my personal presence, I'm sending you this this letter. You see, theological deficiency, a lack of understanding biblical truth, always causes problems when you run into real-life situations. That's what the Apostle Paul is putting his finger on here. He's saying some things are happening in the church. They're being persecuted. And so that's, that's something from outside, but then even just the natural course of life in a fallen world is also occurring. They're having some members in their church who are dying. As best we could tell, that was just of natural causes. So you've got persecution from the outside. You've got death happening, which is just a part of the broken fabric of this world. And he says, you need to make sure that you're not uninformed. You need to make sure that you're not uh, without a theological understanding of what this suffering is, what this affliction means, how to process these things. You can't be uninformed. And so he's writing to make sure that they have a theology that is robust enough to stand up to life kicking them in the face because that's what life does, isn't it? That's what the Apostle Paul is acknowledging here. Sometimes life absolutely knocks you down or I should say would knock you down if you had not the hope that accurate theology gives to you, which will prop you up when circumstances would otherwise knock you down. He says you can't be uninformed. So let me show you what theological truths come to bear upon your suffering. And the Apostle Paul tells them, in fact, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, he says this, that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this, that being affliction. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it has come to pass and just as you know. See, Paul is again saying that suffering will overtake us. But even if it's an unprecedented kind of suffering, it should never be an unexpected suffering. These are weeks old Christians, and he's already saying to them, hey, you remember when I was with you, what did I tell you to expect? (laughs) Suffering. What did I tell you was going to happen? Things were going to go wrong. What did I tell you to look forward to? Trouble. This is a broken, fallen world with broken, fallen people, and affliction will be par for the course in this life. But we have a distinct advantage as Christians in times of affliction. It's two things. Number one, 
we're expecting it. It doesn't catch us off guard when we suffer or when affliction comes or when things in a broken world present themselves as broken. We're expecting that. So we are unsurprised. But secondly, we know the future. We know the future. Let's look now at verse 14 and see a little bit of that future. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with Him those who have fallen asleep. So, why is it that we can suffer with our hope intact? Why is that? Well, he's going to look at the death and resurrection of Jesus. He says, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, that's why we can have hope even in the wake of death, affliction, persecution, all sorts of sufferings that may befall us because Jesus died and rose again, and we are in Him, which means that when we look at what happened to Jesus, we're looking at our own future. If He died and rose, those who are in Him will also die and be raised. Jesus is the first fruits. He's the firstborn from among the dead, not the only, you see. And so, in Jesus, we see our own future. He says, because the Lord Jesus has died and risen again, and we are in Him, we have that same expectation and so when we suffer, we suffer as those with hope. Why? Because we know the future. And that future becomes even more clear as we continue in verse 15. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with Him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, there's much that could be said about these verses, much commentary throughout church history on the meaning of these verses, but I want to I boil it down to what I believe is the thrust of these verses. Jesus is going to return, and when He does, it will be an exceedingly great day for those who've placed their faith in Him, whether already dead or still alive at the time of His coming. That's effectively what it's saying. This is going to be awesome. It's going to be great. You want that day to come. Hasten that day. We will be truly raised with Him. He says the Lord Himself will descend from heaven. Imagine that. Jesus Himself, the one that we prize, the one that we adore, the one that we worship, the one who has saved us, we will see face to face. The Lord will descend from heaven Himself. And then we will always be with the Lord. No more distance, no more settling for anything less than, faith to, than face to face. We will be with the Lord always. And he says in verse 18, Therefore, so because of that, encourage one another with these words. So how do we encourage one another? By reminding each other of the future rather than being overwhelmed by the pressures of the present, we remind ourselves of the future. We do all things in light of our knowledge of what is to come. The precedented and expected suffering that we experience in this broken world is quickly coming to a close as the Lord Jesus prepares us for His return, during which He will bring all of the rightness of heaven to cover over all of the wrongness of this earth at every level and in every way. We know the future. And in fact, this is what communion is all about because this is what salvation is all about. The new creation, the restoration of what was once good back to its good state. We know communion as remembrance. Jesus says, this do in remembrance of me. But as I've already said, to remember the death of Jesus rightly is to remember what it accomplished. 
And what does the, the death of the Lord Jesus accomplish except securing for us this bright future? That upon His return, those of us who are in Him will have every woe solved, every problem gone. Can you imagine this day? So as we prepare to take these communion elements, I'd ask that you remember the future. Let me pray as we reflect in this time. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your death. And thank you that it wasn't just a sentimental death. It wasn't, it wasn't just something that you did that was kind. It wasn't just an act of love. It was efficacious. It produced something. It did something. It bought something. It didn't potentially save. It did save sinners. And in having saved sinners, you've secured a future for those sinners that is bright, a future that we do not deserve. So God, I pray that you would help us now to come face to face with how much we need the death of Jesus, that we would come face to face with the fact that much of the suffering in this world is suffering that is owing to our own sin and the sins of those around us. And that we would look forward to the day that Jesus returns and he wipes away all of the negative effects of our sin. He has already purchased victory through his death and we look forward to the day that he brings it in its fullness. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. You were a lover before time's beginning. You gave your love freely withholding nothing. Jesus, my Jesus, you carried the weight of the world on your shoulders. You stopped at nothing to prove.
So we've spoken today about the second coming of the Lord Jesus, when he will institute all of the rightness of heaven and cover over the wrongness of this earth. An exceedingly great day that we pray for the hastening of, again, come Lord Jesus, come. But now as we prepare to take these communion elements, I want to make sure that it's crystal clear in our minds why this is a great day for us. And to understand that this will not be a great day for many. This is what 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 9 says. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. Those who are outside of Christ will rue this day. This will be a horrific day for those who have not placed their faith in the atoning death of the Lord Jesus on the cross in the place for their sins. And the only reason that it will be a great day for us is because of what He has done, period. We do not deserve for it to be a good day. We do not deserve to be with Him forever. There is nothing good in us that secures this hope. It is only owing to the loving, sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross in our place. So we need to understand that if we had not placed faith in that death, the wrath-absorbing death of Jesus on the cross for us, then we would receive what was just described by Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. 
but because of this death of Jesus. This second coming of Christ will be for us a glorious day where we get relief from the woes of this world rather than a day of wrath where we are punished for having added to those woes. So we need to know it is only owing to Christ. That's what we remember now. The death of Jesus that secures this future for us. In Luke chapter 22, Jesus says, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So as we take this, remember it should have been you that was broken. It should have been you who was bruised. But because the Lord Jesus took your place, there is no wrath left for you. Let's remember that now as we eat. And then in Luke chapter 22, verse 20, it says this, And likewise the cup after they had eaten, Jesus said, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. He says this is the new covenant, the new promise, the promise of eternal life, the promise of a return of the Lord Jesus that will usher in all that should be That promise is sealed, ratified, secured by the very blood of Jesus. That's what we remember now as we drink. Father God, how good are you that you have secured for us this bright future? Again, not because we deserve it, not because we did anything to earn it, but because the Lord Jesus is good and gracious and kind and laid himself down so that we could be lifted up. God, thank you that though we grieve, that though we have times of struggle, we are never without hope because we know the future. Thank you. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Yeah.